Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland and this is, this is Jason's Bedtime Storytime. And I'm going to read a story. from Tales of Folk and Fairies which was uh, from 1919 which is quite an old uh, book and I'm going to read a story called The Meester Storeworm a story from Scotland now I kind of had a little skim through and some of the wording is a little bit so we use the word different you know from uh, how I would normally speak so I'll try and put on a bit of an accent <laughs> I don't know how that's gonna go but there you go so relax yourself and it's gonna I'm gonna send you into a nice little sleep by reading you this story the Meester Stormworm. There was once a lad, and what his real name was, nobody remembered. Unless it was the mother who bore him, but what everyone called him was Ashipattle. They called him that because he sat among the ashes to warm his toes. As you do. He had six older brothers and they did not think much of him. This is starting off pleasant, isn't it? How positive. All the tasks they scorned to do themselves they put upon Ashipattle. He gathered the sticks for the fire. He swept the floor. He cleaned the byre, whatever that is. He ran the errands, and all he got for his pains were kicks and cuffs and mocking words. So why did he do it? Why did you do it then? But anyway, still he was a merry fellow. And as far as words went, he gave his brothers as good as they sent. Oh, so he did stick up for himself. Ashipattle had one sister and she was very good and kind to him. In return for her kindness, he told her long stories of trolls and giants and heroes and brave deeds. As long as he would tell, she would sit and listen. But his brothers could not stand his stories and used to throw clods at him to make him be quiet. I'm not sure what a clod is. Is it like a cow pat? A miniature elephant? I don't know. They were angry because Ashipattle was always the hero of his own stories. <laughs> that would be annoying, wouldn't it? And in his tales, there was nothing he dared not do. Now, while Ashipattle was still a lad, but a tall, stout one, a great misfortune fell upon the kingdom. For a storeworm rose up out of the sea, and of all storeworms it was the greatest and the worst. Don't know what a storeworm is. So for this reason it was called the Meester storeworm. Its length strength stretched half around the world its one eye was red as fire and its breath was so poisonous that whatever it breathed upon was rivered so there's probably a few Scottish words here that um, I don't know what they are or what they mean but from, from the context of the sentence, 
I guess the word withered is not a good it's not a good thing to have happen to you. You know. There was great fear and lamentation throughout the land. It's a very biblical word, isn't it? Lamentation. And throughout the land because of the worm. For every day it drew nearer to the shore and every day the danger from it grew greater. When it was first discovered, it was so far away that its back was no more than a low, long, black line upon the horizon. But soon it was near enough for them to see the horns upon its back and its scales and its one fiery eye and its nostrils that breathed out and in. They could have just said nostrils, couldn't they? I mean, nostrils breathe. That's, yeah. Anyway, in their fear, the people cried upon the king to save them from the monster. But the king had no power to save them more than any other man. His sword, Snigger Snapper, was the brightest and sharpest and most wonderful sword in all the world. But it would need a longer sword than Snicker Snapper to pierce through the great body to the monster's heart. Are you feeling sleepy yet? The king summoned his counsellors all the wisest men in the kingdom and they consulted and talked together but none of them could think of any plan to beat or drive the storeworm off so powerful it was so they wanted to beat off the storeworm but they couldn't beat, beat it off because it was so powerful now there was in that country a sorcerer and the king had no love for him oh wonder what they fell out of over maybe they never were friends maybe they just heard things about him and didn't like what he heard i don't know it doesn't doesn't say still when all the wise men and counsellors could think of no plan for destroying the storeworm, the king said, Let us send for this sorcerer and have him brought before us and hear what he has to say, for twould seem there is no help in any of us for this evil that has come upon us. So the sorcerer was brought and he stood up in the council and looked from one to another. Looked from one to another. Okay, right. Last of all, he looked at the king and there his eyes rested. There is one way. Mm, mm, and only one way, mm, said he by which the land can be saved from destruction. Let the king's only daughter, the princess, Gem Lovely, be given to the storeworm as a sacrifice, and he will be satisfied and quit us. No sooner has the sorcerer said this that a great tumult arose in the council. I don't know what a tumult is, but I imagine... Let's see, does it, does it tell me here what a tumult is? Uh, a loud, confused noise, especially one caused by a large mass of people. Okay, brilliant. Um, so people started talking. I mean, you would, wouldn't you, I guess? He wants to do what with a princess? The councillors were filled with horror 
and cried aloud that the sorcerer should be torn to pieces for speaking such words. Now, I'm not a parent. However, I can't imagine I'd be too pleased with someone turning up and saying, yes, we must sacrifice your daughter. So... wouldn't have been too impressed anyway but the king arose and bade them be silent and he was as white as death is this the only way to save my people he asked <laughs> the only way I know of, <laughs> answered the sorcerer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh dear. <clears throat> the king stood still and white for a while, for a time. Then he said, Then, he said, If it is the only way, so let it be. But first let it be proclaimed far and wide throughout my kingdom that there is an heroic deed to be done. Whosoever will do battle with the storeworm and slay it or drive it off shall have the princess gem lovely for a bride and the half of my kingdom and my sword snickersnapper for his own and after my death he shall rule as king for all the realm then the king dismissed the council and they went away in silence with dark and heavy looks. A proclamation was sent out as the king commanded, saying that whoever could kill the storeworm or drive it away should have the princess and half of the kingdom as a reward, and the king's sword and the king's death should reign and after the king's death should reign over the whole realm. When this news went out, many a man wished he might win these free prizes for himself, for what better was there to be desired than a beauteous, beauteous wife, a kingdom to reign over, and the most famous sword in all the world? But fine as were the prizes, only six and thirty bold hearts came to offer themselves for the task. So great was the fear of the storm worm. So six and thirty, so thirty-six. Why could I just say thirty-six? Six and thirty. I mean, you would say 30 and an extra 6, not 6, or oh, plus an extra 30 on top of that. No, that's weird. Of this number, the first 12 who looked at the storeworm fell ill at sight of him and had to be carried home. The next 12 did not stay to be carried, but ran home on their own legs. They used their own legs. And, sh and shut themselves up in strong fortresses. And the last twelve stayed at the king's palace with their hearts in their stomachs and their wrists too weak with fear to strike a blow, even to win a kingdom. So there was nothing left but for the princess to be offered up to the storeworm, for it was better 
that one should be lost even though that one were the princess then the whole country should be destroyed so yeah I guess that makes sense but what a choice to have to make then there was great grief and lamenting throughout the land for the princess Jem Lovely she was so kind and gentle she was beloved by all both high and low only Ashipattle heard it all unmoved he said nothing but sat by the fire and thought and thought and what his thoughts were he told nobody the day was set when the princess was to be offered to the store worm and the night before there was a great feast at the palace but a sad feast it was little was eaten and less was said the king sat with his back to the light and bit his fingers and no one dared to speak to him in the poorer houses there was a great stir and bustle and laying out of coats and dresses for many were planning to go to the seashore to see the princess offered up to the store worm I suppose if you're gonna have to sacrifice your princess that you love and do you know worship and that you might as well make a day out of it might you have a picnic though a gruesome sight would be to see Ashipattle's father and brothers were planning to go with the rest but his mother and sister wept and said that they would not see it for anything in the world now Ashipattle's father had a horse named Feet Gong <laughs> and he was not much to look at that's nice isn't it it's a horse why have a go at a horse oh he had an ugly horse why, why even say that nevertheless the farmer treasured him and it was not often he would let him, anyone use him by himself when the farmer rode feet gong he could make him go like the wind none faster and that without beating him either that's nice so you didn't have to you didn't have to beat this uh, horse that you love so much that's, that's good then when the farmer wished him to stop feet gong would stand as still as though he were frozen to the ground I wonder if there's a point to this story about the horse it feels more like an ad break, doesn't it? Like, so like, let's talk about horse for a little while and then we'll go back to the actual story in a minute. No one could make him budge. Okay, when he stood still like that. But if any one other than a farmer rode him, then it was quite different. Feet Gong would jog along. Not even a beating would drive him faster. Only if you're a horse and this person that's supposed to be a horse lover is riding you on top of you and is beating you with a whip or a stick then go faster and then stop suddenly ideally just you get into the road so the, the person on top of you falls over off of the horse, off of you and then trample on them <laughs> yeah that's advice to a horse that doesn't like getting whipped don't whip horses, stop it 
Feet gone would jog along and not even a beater would drive him faster. And then if one wanted him to stop, and that was a hard to do as it was as it was to start him. Ashipattel was sure there was some secret about this that his father had a way to make him go that no one knew about. No one little little secret. Little, little secret. But what that way was he could not find out the day before the beauteous gem lovely was to be sacrificed Ashipattle said to his mother tell me something how is it that feet gold will not go for you or my brothers or anyone but when my father mounts him he goes like the wind, none faster. And his mother answered, Indeed, I do not know. It seemed a strange thing. Um, it seemed, oh God, what voice that? It seems a strange thing that my father would not tell you that, said Ashipattle. And you, his own true wife. To this, his mother answered, "A strange thing," said Ashipattle. Oh, no! Ashipattle says, <laughs> <laughs> "A strange thing," said Ashipattle. And in all the years you've lived together, not a thing have you kept back from him, whether he wished it or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, controversial. But even a good husband always holds back some secrets from his wife. Still, his mother spoke never a word, but Ashy Petal could see that she was thinking. Maybe she was pretending to think. Anyway, that night, Ashipattle lay awake long after the others were asleep. He heard his father snoring and his brothers too, but it seemed his mother could not sleep. She turned and twisted and sighed aloud until at last she awakened her husband. What ails you? No, uh, how does he speak? Yeah, what ails you? he asked. Do you turn and twist in bed and sigh so loud that a body scarce can sleep? It's no wonder I sigh and cannot sleep, answered his wife, sounding a bit too much like the king. Or was it the wizard? I've been, th I've been thinking and turning things around in my mind I can, I can see very plainly that you do not love me as a good husband should love his wife how can you say such a thing asked her husband have I, have I not treated you well all of these years have I not shown you my love in every every way Yes, but you do not trust me, said his wife. You you do not tell me what is in your heart. What have I not told you? What, have, what is it I have not told you? You have not told me about feet gong. You never told me why it is to... He goes like the wind whenever you mount him. And when anyone else rides him, he's so slow, there's no getting anywhere with him. And she begins, he's almost walking backwards. Time goes backwards when you're on him. <laughs> then, she, then she began to, to sob as if her heart would break. You do not trust me, she said. Wait, wait. Wait, wait, said the goodman. 
That is a secret I have never thought to tell anyone, but since you have set your heart on knowing, listen, listen. Only you must promise not to tell a living soul that I tell you now. I, I will tell you now, his wife promised. Then this is it, said the husband. When I want Feet Gong to go modestly fast, I slap him on the right shoulder. When I want him to stop, I slap him on the left shoulder. And when I want him to go like the wind, I blow upon the dried windpipe of a goose. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What? I blow, I blow upon the the dried windpipe of a goose that I always carry in the right hand pocket of my coat. So he carries a goose around in his pocket and blows on its windpipe. Okay, cool. Now, now indeed, I know that you do love me when you tell me this, said his wife. And then she went to sleep. For she was, oh, she was satisfied. She really felt satisfied. That's nice. As she petal waited until near morning, and then he arose and dressed himself he put on the coat of one brother, and the breeches of another, and the shoes of a third, and so on, for his own clothes were nothing but rags. He felt in the right hand pocket of his father's coat, and there, sure enough, he found the dried windpipe of a goose. Still strange, I think. He took that and he took a pot of burning peat and covered it over so it would keep hot. And he, also, he also took a big kitchen knife. Then he went out and led Feet Gong from the stable. He sprang upon his back and slapped him on the right shoulder and away they went. The noise awoke the goodman, and he jumped from bed and ran to the window. Must be the big room. There was one. There, there was someone riding away on his dear feet gong horse. Then he called out at the top of his voice, "Hi, hi!" How feet gong Wow When Feet Gong heard his master call him he stopped and stood stock still I guess that means still just stood there stock still but but Ashy Paddle whipped out whipped out the dried windpipe of the goose and blew upon it and away went feet gong like the wind none could go faster no one could overtake them after a while and not so long either they came to the seashore and there, a little way out from the shore, lay the king's own boat with the boatman in it. He was keeping the boat there until day dawned. Then the king and his court would come, bringing the beauteous gem lovely to offer up to the storeworm. They would put her in the boat and set the sails to carry her toward him. Ashipatel looked out across the water and he could see the black black of the beast or the black back of the beast rising out of the sea 
like a long, long a mountain. He lighted down the feet gong and called across the water to the boatman. Hello, friend. How fares it with you out there? Bitterly, bitterly, bitty, 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 so bitter. Ooh, it's cold, answered the boatman. Here I sit and freeze all night, for it is cold, oh, it's cold, on the water, and not a soul except myself, no, just myself. But what is safe asleep? But what is safe asleep in a good warm bed? Everybody else but me. Me. I'll have a fire here in the pot, called Ashy Petal. Draw your boat into shore and come and warm yourself, for I can see even from here that you are almost perished. That may not do, answered the man. The king and his court may come at any time now and they must find me ready and waiting for them as the commands were then ashy paddle put his pot down on the shore stood and thought a bit i think he might have put one of his fingers up to his chin suddenly he dropped on his knees and began to dig in the sand as though he had gone mad Gold, gold, he shouted. Oh, what is the matter? called the boatman. What have you found? Gold, gold, shouted Ashy Petal. Dig in faster and ever, faster and faster and faster. The boatman thought Ashy Petal must certainly have found a treasure in the sand. He made haste to bring the boat to land. He sprang up upon the shore and pushing ashy petals aside, he dropped on his knees and began to scoop out the sand. But ashy petal did not wait to see whether he found anything. He caught up the pot and leapt into the boat and before the boatman could stop him, he pushed off from the shore. Too late the boatman saw what he was doing. He ran down the edge of the water and shouted and stormed and cried to Ashipattle to come back with his boat. Bring my bloody boat back. But Ashipattle paid no heed to him. He ignored him in other words. He never even turned his head. He set the sail and steered over towards where the great monster lay, with the waves washing up and breaking into the foam against him. And now the dawn was breaking. It was time for the monster to awake, and down the road from the castle came riding the king and all his court, and the princess Jamalavli rode among them on a milk white horse all the color was gone from her face and she looked as white as, as snow when the king and all the others reached the shore there stood the boatman wringing his hands and lamenting and the boat was gone what is there asked the king what is there asked the king what have you done with my boat and why are you standing here look look cried the boatman and he pointed out the sea the king looked and then saw 
then first he saw Ashipatul in the boat sailing away, sailing away, sailing away towards the shouted <laughs> the monster over. Now from before his eyes he had been dim with sorrow and he had been he had seen naught but what was close before him. The king looked and all the court looked with him and a great cry arose for they guessed that Ashipattle was sailing out to do battle with the storeworm. As they stood staring in the sun shone red. The sun shone, okay. Uh, as they stood staring the sun shone red, shone red and the monster awoke. Slowly, slowly, his great jaws opened in a yawn. And as he yawned, the water rushed into his mouth like a great flood on down his throat. Ashipattle's boat was caught in a swirl and swept forward faster than any sail could carry it. Then slowly the monster closed his mouth, and all was still, and all was still safe. All was still, save for the foaming and surging of the waters. Ashipattle steered his boat close, in against the the monster's jaws, and it lay there, rocking in the tide while he waited for the storeworm to jaw to yawn again to have another big yawn presently slowly slowly the great jaws gaped and the flood rushed in foaming ashipattle's boat was swept in with the water and it almost crushed against one of the monster's teeth but Ashipattle fended it off and it was carried on the boat it was carried on the flood rather down into the storm throat down and down went the boat with Ashipattle in it and the sound of surging waters filled his ears it was light there in the monster's throat for the roof of the sides of it shone with phosphorescence so that he could see everything as he swept on the roof above him grew lower and lower and the water grew shallower and shallower for it drained off into the passages that opened off from the throat into the rest of the body at last the roof grew so low that the mast of the boat wedged against it then Ashipattle stepped over the side of the boat into the water and it had grown so shallow it was scarce as high as his knees he took the pot of the peat that was still hot and the knife and went a little further until he came to see where the beast's heart was he could not see the beat beat beating Ashipattle took his knife and dug a hole in the heart and emptied the hot peat into it then he blew and blew on the peat. He blew until his cheeks almost cracked with blowing. So she got, yeah, she enjoyed blowing, but it was quite a bit too much, maybe. And it seemed as though the peat would never burn. But at last, at last it flared up. And the oil of the heart trickled down upon it 
and the flame burst into a uh, blaze higher and higher waxed the fire all the <laughs> Ooh, a little bit of a rhyme there all the heart shone red with the lights of it then the lad ran back and jumped into the boat and pushed it clear off the roof and none too soon for as the first as the fire burned deeper into the heart the monster felt the burn of it and began to riff 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 of it and jealous it then he gave a great cough that sent the water surging back out of his body and into the sea again in a mighty flood ashy petal boat was caught in the rush and swept like a straw upon or up out of the store worm, worm's throat and into the light of day the monster spewed him and his wife and his boat not his wife his boat so the monster spewed him and his boat all the way across the sea upon the shore almost at the king's feet the king himself sprang from his steed and ran and helped Ashipatel to his feet. Then everyone fled back to a high hill, for the sea was rising in a mighty flood with the beating and tossing of the store worm. Then again, such a sight as never was seen before and perchance will never be seen again for first the monsters flung his tail so high and next it fell into the sea with such a slap as sent the waves high up the rocks and now it was his head that flung aloft and the tongue caught on the point of the crescent moon and hung there and for a while it looked as though the moon would be pulled from the sky but it stood firm and the monster's tongue tore so that their head dropped back into the sea with such force that the teeth flew out of its head and its mouth rather and these teeth became the Orkney Islands really again its head reared high and fell back and more teeth flew out and these became the Shetland Islands the third time his head rose and fell and teeth flew out they became the Faroe Islands so the monster beat and threshed and struggled while the king and the princess and Ashipattel and all the people looked on with fear and wonder at the dreadful sight but at last the struggle became weaker for the heart was almost burned out then a storeworm curled up and lay still for it was dead and its great coils became the place called Iceland so was the monster killed and that was the manner of his death oh no it wasn't a question so was the monster killed and that was the manner of his death but the king turned to Ashipattel and called him son and took the hand of the princess Jem Lovely and laid it in his lad's hand for now she was to be his bride as the king had promised then they all rode back to the palace together and the king took the sword snicker snapper and gave it to Ashipattel for him to keep as his own um, 
a great feast was spread in honour of the slaying of the store worm. All who chose, chose to come were welcome, and all was mirth and rejoicing. The honest farmer, Ashipattle's father, and his mother, and his sister, and his brothers, heard the feast, and put on their best clothes, and came. But the farmer had no feet gone to ride. When they entered the great hall, and saw Ashipattle sitting there at the king's right hand, in the middle, in the place of honour, with the Princess Gem Lovely beside him, they could hardly believe their eyes, for they had not known he was the hero everyone was talking about. But Ashy Pattle looked at them and nodded, and all was well. Not long after that, Ashipattle and the princess were married, and a grand wedding it was, I can tell you. And after the old king died, Ashipattle became ruler of the whole realm, and he and the princess lived in mutual love and happiness together the rest of their long lives. Now go to sleep. <laughs>